The Cube's live coverage is made possible by funding from Dell Technologies, creating technologies that drive human progress. Welcome to the FIRA in Barcelona, everybody. This is theCUBE's coverage of MWC 23, day one of that coverage. We have four days of wall-to-wall -wall action going on. The place is going crazy. I'm here with Dave Nicholson. Lisa Martin is also in the house. Today's ecosystem day, and we're really excited to have Manish Singh, who's the CTO of the Telecom Systems Business Unit at Dell Technologies. He's joined by Doug Wolf, who's the head of strategy for the Telecom Systems Business Unit at Dell. Gents, welcome. Thank what you. a show. I mean, really the first major MWC, or used to be Mobile World Congress, since you guys have launched your telecom business, you kind of did that sort of in the COVID transition, but really exciting, obviously a huge, huge venue to match the huge market. So Manish, how did you guys get into this? What did you see? What, what was the overall thinking to get Dell into this business? Yeah. Well, I mean, just to start with, you know, if you look at the telecom ecosystem today, uh, the service providers in particular, they are looking for network transformation, driving more disaggregation into their network so that they can get better utilization of the infrastructure, but then also get more agility, more cloud native characteristics onto their, uh, for their networks in particular. And then further on, it's important for them to really start to accelerate the pace of innovation on the network itself, to start uh, more supply chain diversity, that's one of the challenges that they've been having. Uh, and so these, there have been all these market forces that have been really getting these service providers to really start to transform the way they have built the infrastructure in the past which was legacy monolithic architectures to more cloud native, disaggregated. And from a Dell perspective, you know, that really, gives us the permission to play, to really, given all the expertise on the work we have done in the IT with all the IT transformations to leverage all that expertise and bring that to the service providers and really help them in accelerating their network transformation. So that's where the journey started. We've been obviously ever since then working on expanding the product portfolio on our compute platforms to bring telco great compute platforms with more capabilities and we can talk about that, but then working with partners and building the ecosystem to again create this disaggregated and open ecosystem that will be more cloud native uh, and really meet the objectives that the service providers are. Great, thank you. So, so Doug, the strategy obviously is to attack this market, as Manish said, from an open standpoint. That's sort of new territory. It's like a little bit like the wild, wild west. So maybe you could double click on what Manish was saying from a from a strategy standpoint, yes, the telcos need to be more flexible, they need to be more open, but they also need this reliability piece. So talk about that from a strategy standpoint yeah. of what you guys saw. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Manish mentioned, you know, Dell getting into open systems isn't something new. You know, Dell has been yeah. kind of playing in that world for years and years. But the opportunity in telecom that came was opening of the RAN, the core network, um, the edge, all of these with 5G really created a wide opening for us. Um, so we started developing products and solutions, um, you know, built our first telecom grade um, servers for open RAN over the last year, and we were ta we'll talk about those at the show. Um, but you know, as, as Manish mentioned, a, an open ecosystem is new to telecom. I, I've been in the telecom business along with Manish for you know, 25 plus years, and this is a new thing that they're embarking on. Um, so, started with virtualization about five, six years ago, and now moving to cloud native architectures on the core, um, suddenly there's this need to have multiple parties partner really well, share specifications, and put that together for an operator to consume. And I think that's just the start of really where all the challenges are and mm -hmm. the opportunities that we see. Where, where are we in this transition cycle? When the average consumer hears 5G, feels like it's been around for a long time because it was hyped beforehand. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about moving to an open infrastructure model from a proprietary closed model, when is the opportunity for Dell to become part of that? Is it, are, are, there, are there specific sites that have already transitioned to 5G, therefore they've either made the decision to be open or not? Or are there places where 5G, the 5G transition has taken place 
and they might then make a transition to open RAN right. with 5G. Where, where are we in that cycle? What does the opportunity yeah. look like? I'll, I'll kind of take it from the topology of the operator, and I'm sure Manish will build on this, but if I look back in the core, started to get virtualized you know, back around 2015, 16, with some of the lead operators like AT&T, et cetera. Um, so Dell has been partnering with those operators for some years, um, so it really it's happening on the core, but it's moving with 5G to more of a cloud-like architecture, number one, and number two, they're going beyond just virtualizing the network. Um, you know, they previously had used OpenStack, and most of them are migrating to more of a cloud-native architecture that Manish mentioned. And that is a bit different in terms yeah. of, there's more software vendors in that ecosystem because the software is disaggregated also. Um, so Dell's been playing in the core for a number of years, but we brought out new solutions, um, we've announced at the show, for the core. And the parts that are really starting that transition of maybe where the core was back in 2015 is on the RAN and on the edge in particular. Because NFV kind of predated the ascendancy of cloud, exactly. yeah. right? So it really didn't have the impact that people had hoped. And there's something, when you look back, because it's not same wine, new bottle as the open systems movement. There are a lot of similarities, but you, know, you mentioned cloud, cloud native. You really didn't have, back in the 90s, true engineered systems. You didn't really have AI that, you know, to speak of at the sort of volume, the data that we have. So, Manish, from a, from a CTO's perspective, how are you attacking some of those differences and bringing that to market? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you touched on some very important points there. So first of all, to Doug's point, a lot of this transformation started in the core, right? And as the technology evolution progressed, the opportunities opened up, it has now come into the edge and the radio access network as well, in particular with open RAM. And so when we talk about the disaggregation of the you know, infrastructure from the software itself and an open ecosystem, this now starts to create the opportunity to accelerate innovation. And I really want to pick up on the point that you said on AI, for example. AI and machine learning bring a whole new set of capabilities and opportunities for the service providers to drive better optimization, better performance, better sustainability and energy efficiency on their infrastructure, on and on and on. But to really tap into these technologies, they really need to open that up to third parties, implementation solutions that are coming up. And again, the end objective remains to accelerate that innovation. Now, that said, all these things need to be brought together, right, and delivered and deployed in the network without any degradation in the KPIs and actually improving the performance on different vectors, right? So this is what the current state of play is and with disaggregation, I'm a definitely a believer that all these new technologies, including AI machine learning, and there's a whole area, host area of problems that can be solved and attacked and are actually getting attacked uh, by applying AI and machine learning onto these networks. Well, open obviously is good. Nobody's ever going to you know, yeah. argue that open is a bad thing. It's like democracy is a good thing, yeah. right? At least amongst us. And so, but, but the, 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 the RAN, Ha, the open RAN has to be as reliable and performant right, as these, these closed networks. Or maybe not, maybe it doesn't have to be identical. This has to be close enough in order for that tipping point to occur. Is that a fair summarization? What are you guys hearing from carriers in terms of their willingness to sort of put their toe in the water? And, and what can we expect in terms of the maturity model of, of open RAN and adoption? Right, so I, I mean, I think on, on performance, that, that, that's a tough one. I think um, the operators will demand performance. And you've seen experiments, you've really seen more of the Greenfield operators kind of launch okay. open RAN or VRAN type solutions. So they're going to disrupt. Yeah, they're going to disrupt. Yeah. And there's flexibility in an open RAN architecture also for 5G that, they, that they're interested in. And, and I think the Brownfield operators are too, but let's say maybe the Greenfield jump first in terms of doing that from a mass deployment perspective. Um, but I still think that it's going to be critical to meet very similar SLAs and end user performance. And you know, I think that's where you know, maturity of that model is what's required. I, I think brownfield operators are conservative in terms of you know, going with something they know. Um, but the opportunities and the benefits of that architecture and building new flexible potentially cost advantaged over time solutions 
um, that's what the, where the real interest is going forward. And, and new services that you can introduce Absolutely. much more quickly. You know, the interesting thing about Dell to me, you don't compete with the carriers. The, the, the public cloud vendors though, the carriers are concerned about them sort of doing an end run on them. So you provide a, 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 a potential partnership for the carriers that's non-threatening, right? Because you're, you're an arms dealer, you're selling hardware and software, right? But, but how do you see that? Because we heard in the keynote today, one of the, the, the telco, I think it was the chairman of Telefonica said, you know, cloud guys can't do this alone. You know, they need you know, this massive you know, build out. And so, so what do you think about that in terms of your relationship with the carriers not being threatening? I mean, versus say, potentially the cloud guys who are also your partners, I understand. It's a really interesting dynamic, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, I mean, the way I look at it, the carriers actually need someone like Dell to really come in who can bring in the right capabilities, the right infrastructure, but also bring in the ecosystem together mm -hmm. and deliver a performant solution that they can deploy and that they can trust, number one. Number two, to your point on cloud, I mean, from a Dell perspective, you know, we announced our Dell Telecom Multi-Cloud Foundation. And as part of that, last year in September, we announced what we call as the Dell Telecom Infrastructure Blocks. The first one we announced with Wind River. And this is, think of it as a, the infra, you know, hardware and the cache layer all pre-integrated with a lot of automation around it, factory integrated, you know, delivered to customers in an integrated model with all the licenses, everything. And so it starts to solve the day zero, day one, day two integration, deployment, and then life cycle management uh, for them. So to, to broaden the discussion, our view is it's a multi-cloud world. The future is multi-cloud where you can have different clouds which can be optimized for different workloads. So, for example, while our work with Wind River initially was very focused on virtualization of the radio access network, we just announced our uh, infrastructure block with Red Hat, which is very much targeted and optimized for core network and edge, right? So, you know, there are different workloads which will require different capabilities also, and so, you know, again, we're bringing those things to the to these service providers to again bring those cloud characteristics and, and cloud native architecture for their network. And it's going to be hybrid. Yeah, you know, to your yeah and, you, and so. you just hit on something, you said cloud characteristics. Yeah. Um, if you look at this through the lens of kind of the general world of IT, sometimes when people hear the word cloud, they immediately leap to the idea that it's a hyperscale cloud provider. In this scenario, we're talking about radio towers that have intelligence living on them and physically at the base. And so the cloud characteristics that you're delivering might be living physically in these remote locations all over the place. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's true. That, that will definitely happen over time. But I think, I think we've seen the hyperscalers enter, um, you know, public cloud providers enter at the edge. And yeah. they're, they're dabbling maybe with private. Um, but I think the public RAN is another further challenge, I think, that may be a little bit down the road for them. Um, so I think that is a different characteristic that you're talking about, managing the macro RAN environment. Yeah. If I may just uh, yeah. add one more perspective to this. Cloud, I mean, I mean, again, the hyperscale cloud, right? I mean, that world's been great when you can centralize a lot of compute capability and, 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 and you can then start to you know, do workload aggregation and use the infrastructure more efficient. When it comes to telecom, it is inherently a distributed architecture where right. you have access, you talked about radio access, your core, and it is inherently distributed because it has to provide the coverage and capacity. And so, you know, it does require different kind of capabilities when you're going out and about. And this is where I was talking about things like, you know, we just talked, we just, uh, have been working on our bare metal orchestration, right? This is, what we're bringing is a capability where you can actually have distributed infrastructure, you can deploy, you can actually manage, do life cycle management in a distributed multi-cloud form. So it does require you know, different set of capabilities that need to be enabled. Yeah, some, some when talking about cloud would argue that it's always been information technology, it always will be information technology, and especially as what we might refer to as public cloud or hyperscale cloud providers, are delivering things essentially on premises. It's like, well is that cloud? Because it feels like some of those players are going to be delivering physical infrastructure outside of their own data centers in order to address this. It seems the nature, 
the nature of the beast is that some of these things need to be distributed. So it seems perfectly situated for Dell. Well, I mean, I mean, that's yeah. why you guys are both uh, yeah. at Dell now and not working for other telecom <laughs> places, right? Exactly, exactly, I mean, yes. It's definitely an exciting space. It's transformed, the networks are under transformation and I do think yeah, Dell's very well positioned to, to really help the customers, the service providers in accelerating their transformation journeys with an open ecosystem. You've got the brand yep. and the breadth and the resources to actually attract an ecosystem, but I wonder if you could sort of take us through your strategy of, of, of ecosystem, the challenges that you've seen in developing that ecosystem, and, and what the vision is that ultimately, what's the outcome going to be of that open ecosystem? Yeah, I, I can start, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe just to give you the big picture, right? I mean, the big picture is disaggregation with performance, right TCO models to the service providers, right? And it starts at the infrastructure layer, builds on bringing these cloud capabilities, the, the, the cast layer, right? Bring in the right accelerators. All of this requires to pull the ecosystem. So give you an example. Uh, on the infrastructure, you know, telco grade servers like XR8000 uh, with Sapphire, Intel Sapphire, uh, uh, the, the new Intel processors mm -hmm. that we've just announced, and an extended array of servers. These are telco grade, short depth, et cetera, you know, the, the telco grade characteristic. Working with uh, partners like Marvell, Qualcomm, bringing in the accelerators in there, that's important to again drive that performance and optimize for the TCO. Working then with partners like Wind River, Red Hat, et cetera, to bring in the CAS capabilities, so you can start to see how this ecosystem starts to build up. And then very recently we announced our, uh, our private 5G solution with uh, Airspan and Expedo on the core side. So, bringing those workloads together. Similarly, we have an open RAN solution we announced with Fujitsu, so it's, it's open, it's disaggregated, but bringing all these together, and one of the last things I would say is, you know, to make all this happen, and make all of these, we've also been putting together our OTEL, our Open Telecom Ecosystem Lab, which is very much geared to really gives this open ecosystem a playground where they can come in and do all that heavy lifting which is anyways required to do the integration, optimization and more. So, put all these capabilities in place, but the end goal, the end vision again, is that cloud native, disaggregated infrastructure that starts to innovate at the speed of software and scales at the speed of cloud. And this is different than the 90s. You didn't have, you didn't have something like Otel back then. You know, you didn't have the the developer ecosystem that you have today because the, the, on top of everything that you just said, Manish, there are new workloads and new applications that are going to be developed. Right. Doug, anything you'd add to what Manish said? Yeah, I mean, as Manish said, I, I think adding to the infrastructure layers, which are you know, critical for us to, to help integrate, right? Because we kind of took the, a vertical telco stack and we've disaggregated it and it's gotten a little bit more complex. So our solutions, Dell Technology Infrastructure Block and our, our lab infrastructure with Otel helps put those pieces together. But without the software players in this, you know, that's what we really do, I think, in Otel. Um, and that's just starting to grow. So integrating with those software providers with that integration is something that the operators need. Um, so we fill a gap there in terms of either providing engineer solutions so they can readily build on or actually bringing in that software provider. And I think that's what you're going to see more from us going forward, is just get, it, extending that ecosystem even further. More software players, effectively. In, in thinking about uh, ORAN, are they, is it possible to have the, the, the low latency, the high performance, the reliability capabilities that carriers are used to, and the flexibility or can you sort of prioritize one over the other from a go-to-market and rollout standpoint and, and, and optimize one, maybe get a foothold in the market? How do you see that balance? Well, the answer is absolutely yeah. yes, you can have both. But we are on that journey. We are on that journey. This is where all these things I was talking about in terms of the right kind of accelerators, right kind of capabilities on the infrastructure. Obviously, retargeting the software, there are certain changes, et cetera, that need to be done on the software itself to make it more, more cloud native. And then building all the surrounding uh, capabilities around the CICD pipeline and all, where it's not just day zero or day one, that you're doing the cloud-like life cycle management of this infrastructure. But the, the answer to your point, yes, absolutely, it's, it's possible the technology is there and the ecosystem is coming together and that's the direction. Now, 
Are there challenges? Absolutely there are challenges, but, but directionally, that's the direction the industry is moving to. I guess my question, Manish, is do they have to go in lockstep? Because I would argue that the public cloud when it first came out wasn't nearly as functional as what I could get from my own data center in terms of recovery. You know, backup and recovery is a perfect example. And it took you know, a decade plus to get there, but it was right. the flexibility and yeah. the openness and the developer affinity, the programmability that, that attracted people. Do you see ORAN following a similar path, or does it, my question is, does it have to have that carrier class reliability yeah, Everything today? on day one, does yeah. it have to have everything yeah, on day I one? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I, you know, like again, the Greenfield operators, I think, we're, we're willing to do a little bit more experimentation. Um, I, I think the operators, brownfield operators that have existing you know, deployments, they're going to want to be closer, <laughs> but I think there's room for innovation here. Um, and clearly, you know, Manish came from, um, from Meta, and we're, we've been very involved with TIP, we're very involved with the ORAN Alliance, and as Manish mentioned, with all those accelerators that we're working with um, on our infrastructure, that is a space that we're trying to help move the ball forward. Um, so I, I think you're seeing deployments from mainstream operators, but it's maybe not in you know, downtown New York deployment. They're more rural yeah. deployments. So I think that's getting at you know, kind of your question, is there's maybe a little bit more flexibility there. They get to experiment with the technology and the flexibility, and then I think it will start to And that's evolve. where the disruption's going to yeah. come yeah. from, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where was the first place you could get reliable 4K streaming of video content? It wasn't ABC, CBS, NBC. <laughs> yeah. It was YouTube. Right. So is it possible that when you say Greenfield, are a lot of those going to be what we refer to as private 5G networks, where someone may set up a private 5G network that has more functions and capabilities than the public network? Yeah, is it, that, it, that's exactly where I was going, is yeah. that, you know, that, that's why you're seeing us getting very active in 5G solutions that Manish mentioned with, right. you know, Expedo and Airspan. There's okay. more of those that we haven't publicly announced, so you'll, I think you'll be seeing more announcements from us. Um, but that is really, you know, a new opportunity, and there's spectrum there also, right? I mean, there's public and private spectrum. We plan to work directly with the operators and do it in their spectrum when needed. But we also have solutions that will do it, um, you know, on on uh, non-public spectrum. So let's close out. Oh, good. You have something to add I'm there, please? I'm just going to add one more point to to, to Doug's yeah, point, right? Is if you look on the private 5G and the end customer, it's the enterprise, right? And they're, they're not a service provider, they're not a carrier, they're more used to deploying you know, enterprise infrastructure, maintaining, managing that. So, you know, private 5G, especially with this open ecosystem and with, uh, with all the open RAN capabilities, it naturally tends to you know, uh, lend itself very well to meet those requirements that the enterprise would have. And people it, should not think of private 5G as a sort of a, a replacement for, no. for Wi-Fi. Right, it's, it's to, to deal with those you know, intense situations that can afford the additional cost, but absolutely require the reliability and the performance and you know, never go down type of scenario. Is right, that right? Low, yeah. and low latency is usually yes. the, the, the primary characteristics of, you know, for things like industry 4.0 manufacturing requirements. Those are tough SLAs. They're just, they're different than the operator SLAs for coverage and you know, cell performance. They're now, you know, five nine type characteristics, but on a manufacturing floor. That's why we don't use Wi-Fi on the cube to broadcast. Well, we need why a hard would, line. yeah, but why wouldn't you know? it replace Wi-Fi over time? I mean, I, you know, I we I still have a home phone number that's hard hardwired to a line, but it goes to a voicemail. We don't even have handsets yeah, anymore, anymore for it. Yeah, yeah. I be th I think well, unless the cost can come down, but I, I think the Wi-Fi is is is. Is is flexible. It's cheap. It's it's kind of perfect it's, for that. And home it's good environment. technology. And I mean, it works yeah, great, yeah, right? Yeah, for, yeah, for now, yeah, yeah, yeah. for now. But but you wouldn't want it in those situations. Yeah. So you're arguing that yeah. maybe I'm saying eventually, what put a SIM in a device? I don't know. You know, but why not? Yeah, I mean, you know, and Dell Dell offers, you know, from our laptop, you know, our client side, we do offer Wi-Fi, we do offer 4G and 5G solutions, and I think right. those. You know, it's a, it's a volume and scale issue, I yeah, think, right. for yeah. the cost structure you're talking right, right, about. Yeah, yeah, come to our booth and see the connected laptop. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, no, let's, let's close that on that. Why don't you guys talk a little bit about what you're going on at the show. I did go by the booth. You got a whole big lineup of servers. You got some you know, cool devices going on. So give us the rundown and, and you know, let's end with the takeaways here. Yeah, yeah. The, the simple rundown, a broad range of new power edge servers, very broad range addressing core, edge, RAN, 
optimize for those with all the different kind of acceleration capabilities. You can see that. You can see infrastructure blocks. These are with Wind River, with Red Hat. You can see Otel, the open telecom ecosystem lab, where all that playground, the integration, the real work, the real sausage making is happening. Uh, and then you will see some uh, interesting solutions uh, in terms of co-creation that we are doing, right? So, so you, you will see all of that. And not to, not, not to forget the connected laptops. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, and, and um, we mentioned it before, but just to add on, I, I think um, you know, for private 5G, you know, we're, we've announced a few offers here at the show with partners, um, so with Expedo and um, Airspan in particular. And I think, you know, I, I just want to emphasize the partnerships that we're doing, you know, we're doing some you know, fundamental integration on infrastructure, bare metal, and different options for the operators to get engineered systems. But building on that ecosystem is really, the move to cloud native is where Dell is trying to get in front of, and we're, we're offering solutions and a much larger ecosystem to go after it. Great, Manish and Doug, thanks for coming on the program. It's great to have you, awesome discussion. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. All right, us. Dave Vellante for Dave Nicholson and, and Lisa Martin, where we're seeing the disaggre disaggregation of the telco network into open ecosystems with integration from companies like Dell and others. Keep it right there for theCUBE's coverage of MWC 23. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.